begin today by reading three passages of Scripture which are wonderful promises to us living in these days. Psalm 126.6. I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Psalm 126.6. Psalm 126.6. Some of you can have memorized this, no doubt. I like to hear the rustling of the pages. And if you have it, say amen. amen. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. What a promise. We're engaged in evangelism here in this church right now. And uh, I'll tell you what, this is a precious promise. Let's look at another one, Matthew 22, verse 9. Matthew 22, verse 9. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid them to the marriage. We're all invited to a marriage. Matthew 28, verse 19. This is another familiar one. Matthew 28, verse 19. I want to put the emphasis on go. Go ye, okay? We're all go ye's here this morning. <laughs> go ye therefore and, baptize, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Special promise. This promise extends down to our day. He saw us here this morning, and as he said these words to the disciples, wonderful promises here to the people of God's church. What would you consider the key word in this last verse we read? These last two verses. Go, go, okay? <laughs> Commission is go. That's an easy word to overlook. All my life I've known texts like this one, and I've often treated it like it meant uh, pastors and evangelists go, right? Have you, heard, have you thought that way and felt that way? And what go, go meant to me was they go. Who go? Pastors and evangelists, Bible workers, I put money in and they go, right? They, yes, pastors, evangelists, and Bible workers. If my little theory were true, if my little theory were true, and it's not, then the text would say send, not go. Put money in and send people, right? Words are important and the command is addressed to me. I'm not the sender, so was layman, and I consider myself to be a layman. I spent most of my work, time doing secular work, right? <clears throat> I'm a layman too. We're all laymen. The gospel is the great leveler. And all of us have been given the commission to do what? Go. Go. So uh, somehow as laymen, we've developed some sort of a unscriptural phrase that goes like this. Either go or send someone. And this corrupted idea has caused or not, or at least helped multitudes of our people in constant, to be in constant disobedience to the Great Commission that, he, that Jesus left with us. But in reality, we all go, yes. We tend to cocoon a little bit. You know what that means, kind of close. But you know what happens to that cocoon? A beautiful butterfly comes out. And uh, so out of this cocoon, we want to, we want to come out of that cocoon. Uh, the beautiful butterfly, what a promise. I'd like to have you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. This is in the call of Isaiah, chapter 6, verse 8. We're studying Isaiah in our Sabbath school this, this quarter. I'm glad for that. It's wonderful. Uh, I'd like to invite you all to Sabbath school. Come to Sabbath school. I enjoyed the Sabbath school class I was in this morning greatly. And we learn a lot. Isaiah 6, verse 8. And I heard the voice of the Lord say, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? 
Then said I, here am I, send me. That was Isaiah's attitude. Imagine a church. Just imagine it. In your, in your, you know, the human mind has a high capacity for imagining things, right? You remember before the flood, it said that the imaginations of the heart were only what? Evil continually. So it doesn't have to be that kind of imagination. Imagine a church full of soul winners and support groups and prayer warriors. A missionary church, if you will. Can you imagine that? Not all, not all will go door to door. Not all will give Bible studies. But uh, many will pray. Many will constitute a support group. Um, Sabbath mornings here, we have a prayer meeting. We're into evangelism here. And in that prayer meeting, prayers go up for all the people that we're, that we're taking lessons to out there in the community. I would imagine there are probably well over 100 uh, lessons going out right now. Some of them have been, have sent, in, have sent um, you know, uh, responses to receive lessons. Some of them we found just by going knocking on doors, but probably over 100 of them going out every week. It's a new day. You know, the people of the world are so busy taking their programs everywhere. You know that, don't you? The people of the world are busy taking their programs everywhere. Salesmen of all kinds and groups, resourceful methods to get their message out. But politicians have an active outreach and regularly organize, and they even go door to door sometimes. Where the people are. What about the children of the light? You know, as a little boy in Sabbath school, I used to, I used to introduce this little song. This little light of mine. You all do that? How many of you have sung that song? Everybody, okay. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine. I'm going to let it shine until when? Until Jesus comes, okay. Uh, as a young boy, I used to, used to sing that song. And uh, I still remember the words to it. I haven't sung that song for a long time. Yes, the church can reach every creature with gospel light unless God made an impossible demand. You think God made an impossible demand or command or commission? He didn't do that, did he? God made a possible demand, and I believe he did, and I think he equips those who are called. He doesn't call those necessarily that are equipped, right? But he, he equips those who are called. And how many are called? All of us are called. And those that are with him are called and faithful in Revelation. The Lord talks about that in Revelation 17. In the first century, the church that Jesus founded turned, founded, he turned the world upside down. They filled Jerusalem with the doctrines of the apostles, so much so that the, that the people who were in charge of the city and the leaders, they were alarmed. You have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. What a mighty outreach it was. In fact, it worked so well that it made the devils tremble. They had to counter it. So the devil got to work to counter such success, counter it. In the 15th century, there's a counter-reformation, right? It was against the Reformation. So the devil tried to counter it in Jerusalem. Persecution, false teachings, arguments, deceptions of every kind began to rear their evil heads. Jesus predict, predicted that before the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD that this would happen uh, as, the, as the first century church was carrying the gospel to the ends of the earth. And in that final generation, just before Jesus comes, there would be a huge counter-reformation. The Bible says there would be false prophets and false Christs, uh, social unrest, whirlwinds. Have you heard of those things here lately? Whirlwinds and persecution and earthquakes, weather running out of its normalcy. In the first century, Satan's plans caused a lot of trouble. He was able to divide the church one way or another and neutralize the gospel that was being preached so effectively. It included, it included the development of a strong clergy. 
and took witnessing out of the hands of the lay people until it was almost totally in the hands of clergy. That's a snapshot of the, of the, medi of the medieval church. That's what it was like. So the church was divided into two groups, laymen and clergy. And the priesthood of all believers was largely lost sight of through the, through the Middle Ages. Middle and Dark Ages. Actually, there was, the devil had a millennium that time, during that time. There's going to be another millennium, right? But a millennium of that and more. Thus Satan weaseled witnessing out of the hands of the lay people until it became almost an exclusive right of the clergy. I like that little word weasel. <laughs> he weaseled it out, the little weasel. The devil is a clever opponent of God and of truth. He has all kinds of ways to, to uh, slow down the work of the gospel. Consequently, that idea comes down to our days, the final generation so that many have felt that they cannot give Bible studies or otherwise participate in evangelism. Many have felt that way. I have felt that way. I have, there was a time in my life when I sat and, in the church and when the church was over, I'd go home and that'd be the last I'd think of it for the, until the next week. But I sense a new day has come. I've been interestingly observing a phenomena in this church People are praying, giving Bible studies. Twelve teams of two are going out to carrying Bible studies, and a whole support group are praying. I, I, I hear this as they come and go. What a wonderful thing. Desiring to develop, develop outreach uh, and, and, and desiring to develop outreach talents, delivering lessons and so forth. And uh, what an army of workers have developed here in Sierra Vista. And I'm not patting anybody on the back. We give God the glory, right? Amen. It's very reminiscent of the first century church all over again, including prayer warriors and church and uh, support groups and large attendance in prayer meetings. I haven't seen prayer meetings like this with so many people coming. I'd like to invite you to prayer meeting. Uh, and gospel outreach. It's almost like the beginnings of what we see in Isaiah chapter, Isaiah chapter 60, uh, 60, verses 1 to 4. Let's take a little look at that. Isaiah 60, verses 1 to 4. This is the council. And it's not only counsel, but it's a promise involved in this. Look for the promise as we read this. This is a precious passage. Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 to 4. Arise and shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, and the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Precious promise. We haven't seen anything that answers to this yet, but it will come. The Gentiles shall come to thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about and see. All they gather themselves together, and they come to thee. Thy sons shall come from afar, and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Now, there's a promise for us. Uh, I want to see sons and daughters return to the church, don't you? This is a special promise here in Isaiah. Another one in Isaiah chapter 49. Back just a few pages, 22 to 26. Isaiah 49, 22 to 26. In our little prayer meeting, we pray for our sons and daughters. Thank you, Anne, for leading us into that. Isaiah 49. 22 to 26. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles and set up my standard to the people, and they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. And kings shall be, 
and kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth, and lick up the dust of, their, of thy feet, and shall know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait on me. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty, or the lawful captive delivered? But thus saith the Lord, notice here, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will what? What does it say? I will save thy children. I know there are a great number of people in this church who are praying on a regular basis for their children. To accomplish this, we need to see, we need to see a fire. A church on fire. Everybody likes to see a fire, right? <laughs> Isaiah says they return from their captive from their captivities. How many of you have heard of the Adventist poet Adlai Esteb? Anybody remember him? <laughs> okay, I grew up on some of his poems. He wrote several books. They were they're just wonderful. I don't think they're in print anymore. But some of you who have been in the church a long time will remember him. But he talked about fire. He talked about two Canadian geese looking up in the sky and this high-flying jet flying over, leaving a trail behind him. And one goose said to the other one, wow, I wish I could fly like that. And the other goose said, yes, you could. You could do that too if your tail was on fire like his is. <laughs> the word disciple means follower. So by definition, that's what a Christian is, right? Following Jesus. And look at what they did in the first century. Let's just look at that. It's Colossians chapter 1, verse 23. I just love to read this verse over and over again because it's going to be repeated in our day. Colossians chapter 1, verse 23. Colossians 1, 23. I see some of you are still looking. Colossians 1, verse 23. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled... And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which, he, which was preached to every creature under, which is under heaven. Which was preached where? To every creature under heaven. This was written about 64 AD, about 33 years after Jesus went back to heaven. There were missionaries from that Jerusalem group going to Antioch. Missionaries were sent out from Antioch. They went over into India and beyond. Some of, the, some of those People went even up into the Orient, around the Mediterranean Rim and all around the place, the inhabitable world, the God gospel went in that first century. They didn't have the benefit of electronics. They wore their shoes out. They were the gospel in shoes. And I, can, I think I can see the signs of another Pentecost on the horizon. Some of the stories I'm hearing are almost like the book of Acts. You know, the book of Acts is not a finished book. If you let's look, let's look at the last two verses of the book of Acts. <laughs> the book of Acts is not a finished book. It's going to be finished in the final generation, the final generation church. Uh, Acts, the last two verses of the book. And Paul dwelt, dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him preaching the kingdom of God, teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with, with, with all confidence, no man forbidding. That's how it ends. It's an unfinished book. There's no appeal there. It'll be finished in the final generation. And really this book probably should have been named the Acts of the Holy Spirit, right? It's called the Acts of the Apostles. Well, they were, they were used by the Holy Spirit in a mighty way. And I think I can see signs of another Pentecost on the horizon. Some of the stories I'm hearing are almost like the book of Acts. Praise the Lord. You know, Acts is an unfinished book. But let's look at Acts chapter 3, 13 to 21. Acts chapter 3, 13 to 21. Acts 3, 13 to 21. We 
God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the God of our fathers hath glorified the son, his son Jesus, whom he delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he, was deter- when, when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and denied a murder to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are all witnesses. And this is the, this is the name, through faith in his name, that this man hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is, is by him hath, hath given him a perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance you did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God hath, showed, hath before showed unto by the mouth of his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he, made, he hath so fulfilled. Then it says, repent ye therefore. You know, we all had a part in that. That's what the therefore is there for. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken of by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. I want to have us just look at this passage just a little bit. Verses 19 to 21. This is an end time passage. The refreshing from the presence of the Lord is the latter rain. Still to come. This is talking about about a special work that will be performed for the people of God just before Jesus comes. Sins blotted out. And then he'll send Jesus, second coming, whom the heaven must receive until times of restitution of all things. We're living in the days when all things will be restituted. (laughs) Restitution of all things. We're living in some important times of, of Earth's history. I can't think of a time in the history of the world where our brother lived. Now Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. Just back a page. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Don't you long for a day like that? A church so busy that it's united, they don't have time to fight with each other. It's just wonderful. And suddenly there came the sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And they, they, there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. It was the time of the Feast of Weeks, and the Jews were gathering around from, the, from, the, from all around the Mediterranean Rim, and they were in Jerusalem. And many of them didn't know the mother tongue. And they were speaking all kinds of different languages. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together, and they were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Wow. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And now we hear, hear we every man in his own tongue, wherein we were born. That's the purpose of the gift of tongues. All these gifts, I believe, will be restored in the end time again. Communication, it was a communication gift. Every man heard in his own tongue. And when the loud cry of the third angel begins to go forth and the latter rain begins to fall and place God's last day sealed in the foreheads of his people, there will again be signs and wonders. A Pentecost like the world has never, ever seen. It's to that time that we were looking forward. Watch out. The fire will again will fall. And God's last day message will go like the fire in the stubble. I'm amazed at some of the stories I'm hearing. Many of you are seeing miracles in the lives of the people you serve. Connie was telling me a little story yesterday. I'd like to have you come up here and tell that little story. Would you do that? You 
you even received a thank you card for going out. I can't believe this. That's good. And I are going out, you know, delivering these study guides from It Is Written. And this one happened to be a lady from the Voice of Prophecy, so it was a Discover uh, Bible study guide that we'd been leaving with her. And she's a sweet young lady. And I want to read to you what she gave me yesterday. She gave me this card. Dear Connie and David, I would really like to tell you thank you for taking the time to deliver such great study guides. It is refreshing to see the truth of God's word being made available to all people. These study guides have been a useful tool for me as I grow in my relationship with my Lord Jesus Christ. As a born-again believer, I was recently baptized and I have been seeking ways to know him better, so thank you for these helpful guides. They are much needed in times like these. I pray that the the good Lord will continue to bless you as you're working to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. To people like me, I'm encouraged and inspired by meeting you, and you have strengthened my faith. Thank you very much for your kindness. May God bless you and keep you. Uh, this is just an example of the wonderful experiences David and I are having. We have another lady. Um, we've been sharing the um, It Is Written study guides, going into her home and studying with her. Last week, she kept the first Sabbath for the first time. Amen. Yeah, uh, the best she knew how. And she's sharing that information with her daughter. And so, you know, it's just such a privilege. I, uh, Alvin, if you don't mind, I'd like to share a scripture that we read this morning in Sabbath school. Yes. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, and that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Isn't that beautiful? Our feet are beautiful. When we're going out there taking these study guides to people, the Lord considers our feet beautiful. And I also like this scripture, just one more I want to share, mm -hmm. is in Isaiah 51, 11. It says, this is what's going to be our experience when we get to heaven. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Isn't that beautiful? That joy, when we get to heaven, is going to be the people that we've witnessed to here on earth and that have accepted the truth. Isn't that a precious promise for us? If anyone wants to join us and doesn't have a person to witness to, we will find them. Even if we've run out of, uh, you know, it is written, study, uh, you know, names or whatever, we can find them out there. People in this town are searching for truth. It's beautiful, so just contact me if you need any names. David and Connie are our personal ministries leader in this, leader, leaders in this church. And, uh, you know, it's just wonderful. You know, there are people out there looking wistful to, wistfully to heaven for light. And this is not new light. This is precious old light, long, long, long lost sight of. It, people, people are beginning to learn these things, and they wondered why they hadn't seen it before. We could open this up this morning. We could be here two hours real, real easily. <laughs> but I want you to return this afternoon at 4.30. 4 o'clock. I'm sorry, not 4.30. Erase that from your mind. 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock. Uh, it's a tra another training session. You know, I, I read in Christ Object Lessons that the most important thing we can do is develop our talents. Well, I thought the most important we could do is, is, is help other people. But when we develop our talents, we can, under we can help more pe other people more efficiently, can't we? So training sessions this afternoon, it's, a, it's in the form of a 25-minute video put out by It Is Written. And uh, they're wonderful. And so I want to invite everybody to come, be part of this, and be part of the, uh, of the outreach that we, we have here. Bisbee people will be coming here this afternoon also from the Bisbee Church, and uh, we're hoping to have a good group of people. This is our support group. I told the people a couple of weeks ago, this is our evangelism committee. We are going to have evangelism. It'll be the first week in May, first full week in May. Kind of write this on your calendar. The evangelist wants to meet with the church only on Friday night, April the 30th. The next day is the beginning of May. And um, our meetings will be from Saturday night on down through to the next weekend. 
Uh, we hope to have a neutral, neutral location here where we'll bring people at the beginning and then we'll move them to church on Sabbath morning a week from, week after we begin. And uh, we hope we'll have some baptisms at that time. It'd be a wonderful thing. So uh, let's, let's plan for that. April 30, Friday night, the first meeting will be here in the church. Just for church members only and, and people who come here. You don't have to be a church member, but people who are coming here regularly. Uh, each one is welcome to that meeting. So training seminars, that's what we're, that's what we're into right now. And uh, the last moments, movements will be rapid ones. You believe that? I believe the last movements will be rapid ones. And the message of three angels will have an effect on people what they never have before. It's to that day that we are now approaching. It has been called the loud cry of the third angel. Let's read it. Let's feast our eyes on this. This is Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 to 4. This is how it ends up. Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 to 4. The final appeal to the inhabitants of planet Earth before Jesus comes. Revelation 18, 1 to 4. And after these things, I saw another angel. How many angels here now? This is the fourth angel, right? The three angels are found in Revelation 14. Another angel come down from heaven having what? Great power. Angels here are messengers. These are God's people in the end time carrying the message to a final conclusion. Great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, and it become the habitation of devils and the hole of every foul spirit, a cage for every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. This is earth's life's last and final appeal to earth people. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. The call will go out, and multitudes will leave the communions and institutions that constitute Babylon. And out of every ism and nation will come forth people. I'd like to read a couple more verses here. We're uh, rapidly running out of time. But uh, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 19 and uh, take all the comfort you can out of this. Isaiah 19 is uh, an interesting read, the whole chapter is. But at the conclusion of the chapter are, are found these verses. This is how it all ends up. Chapter 19, starting with verse 19 on down to the end of the chapter. In that day, now when the prophet says in that day what, day, what day is he talking about? He's talking about the end time day, right? In that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt. In the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord and it shall be for a sign for a witness unto the Lord of the hosts in the land of Egypt. For they shall cry unto the Lord, and because of their oppressors, and he shall send them a what? Savior. A Savior, and a great one, and he will deliver them. And the Lord shall be known to Egypt, and the, and the Egyptians shall, be, know the, shall know the Lord in that day. Now in end time prophecies, Egypt represents the whole world out there that is, uh, you know, really not, uh, not following God. Verse 21, and the Lord shall be known to Egypt, and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day, and shall do sacrifice and oblation, yea, they shall vow a vow unto the Lord and perform it. And the Lord shall smite Egypt, and he shall smite and heal it, and they shall return even to the Lord. And he shall be entreated of them, and he shall heal them. In that day there shall be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrian will come into Egypt. 
and the Egyptian unto the Assyria, and the Egyptians shall serve the Assyrians. In that day there shall, in that day shall Israel be a third with Egypt, and with Assyria, even the blessing, even a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Egypt. What does it say? My people. <laughs> you think there are people, my people in Egypt? We're not talking about physical Egypt here. We're talking about the end time world. My people in Egypt. The, the great Gentile world out there. Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, mine inheritance, God's church. In fact, this will be such, a, such an outreach and such a turning to the Lord that there will be a multitude which no man can number. It talks about that in, in um, Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. One more. Well, we'll turn to that one. Revelation 7, verse 9. I didn't know I had it in my notes. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. This should be a great, great encouragement to all of us. Revelation 7, verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, what does it say? A great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And the seeds are being planted today, and the Holy Spirit is watering those seeds, and his word will not return unto him void. It's almost like stepping into the water at the Red Sea before the sea parted. It's uh, to that moment that we are now approaching. This is an important moment in Earth's history. I don't think this is just happening in Sierra Vista. I think that God has a program that's going on in the world. I think there's a, a revival beginning to develop. develop. And uh, when the work is finished in Sierra Vista, it'll be finished everywhere else at the same time. And Jesus will come. Yes, the final events will be rapid ones. I can almost hear the footsteps of the great king in Revelation 19, where Jesus is pictured as riding on a white horse and will bring an end to the long reign of sin and deliver his people. And God will be, God and the people, and God's people will not merely be delivered out of it. I'm, I'm sorry, will not merely be uh, quitted, but they will be delivered out of a huge time of trouble. And this will be our final verse this morning. It is Daniel 12, verse 1. Daniel 12, verse 1. We haven't been in Daniel Bible studies lately. When we study Daniel, you open the Bible up and it opens up to Daniel. Daniel 12, verse 1. Take all the comfort you can out of this. There's a great time of trouble coming and God's going to deliver his people out of that trouble. I know many are teaching today that people are going to be raptured away before the trouble. But that's not what this verse says. Let's notice it. Daniel 12, verse 1. At that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a what? Time of trouble such as what was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be what? Delivered. Everyone, who's that, is, everyone that shall be found written in the book. And verse 2, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. And Daniel's been wondering about all of this. Verse 4. And thou, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to when? The time of the end. We're living in the time of the end, friends. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. I think that really means primarily they're running to and fro through the pages of the Bible and knowledge will be increased. But we can apply that to the world around us too. There's a lot of inventions. We've been, we're planning a, a trip to Mars. Did you know that? 
<laughs> but I'm looking forward to a trip where we pass past Mars, right? It's kind of a hostile place out there, I think. It's too cold. But when God's people go to heaven, they'll pass by all of that. And I think the Lord will point it out to us. And he will, uh, he'll smile. It's just a wonderful thing to contemplate. A wonderful promise in Matthew 10, verse 22. Matthew 10, verse 22 says that, well, I can't quote it. Let's turn to it. I was going to quote it. Matthew 10, verse 22. Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. Wonderful promise about uh, abiding till the end, okay? Matthew 10, verse 22. This uh, verse and one, one like it is mentioned a couple of other places in the Bible. This is what it says. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that doeth what? And doeth to the end shall be saved. We, praise God. We don't want to. That's a precious promise, isn't it? I, uh, I believe we're living, we're coming to that day right now. Uh, don't be weary of well-doing. Allow the Holy Spirit to do his work in our own hearts according to the abilities and gifts that we've been given. All of this, that is allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, all of this is our response to the unspeakable sacrifice of our great leader and the head of the church, Jesus Christ. It is the response of gratitude and worship and praise to the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Dear Father in heaven, we're just so thankful that we're living in the days that we're living in and we're seeing the things that we're seeing. We know that you're coming soon. And I pray, Lord, that you'll be with each of us in a very special way. May your spirit speak to our hearts every day and bring to us the glorious gospel of Jesus that we might take, that we might take uh, comfort in. I pray that you will be with each person here today, that you will help each one according to our several needs. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.